Hey guys, Idre here. Today I'm going to be doing the fourth episode in my great classic album series. This is probably one of my favorite things to do on this channel and I've really been enjoying it so far. It doesn't seem to get as many views or as much attention as my, you know, new album reviews. That's to be expected. People love hearing new album reviews because they're fresh in their minds. I get that. But the reason I really like doing this series is a lot of times because I get... I, not only do I get to talk about albums I've grown up listening to that I like quite a bit, but it also inspires me to go out and discover and listen to new music I previously haven't given much attention to. And a lot of times they will talk about that in this video. If you haven't caught on, I do kind of go based on chronological order as well. So, um, essentially albums that come out first out of the 10 albums I talk about in these videos, I cover first. And um, lastly, before I get into this, um, just I want to thank everybody for 150 subscribers. It really does mean a lot considering I started this channel with practically none. And um, I've only been doing this for less than a year now. And um, I started in January, so it's kind of impressive, honestly, to see so much great attention get brought to this channel. So I thank everybody for that. It means the world to me. But today, we are going to start our great... 10 classic albums with Tripping Daisy, Bill from 1992. Tripping Daisy is a band that I think does not get that much attention, at least from where I, you know, I know a lot of people who like them, but they've yet to get a lot of praise, per se, from the average music community. They often get kind of pushed aside amongst many of their contemporaries. But their sort of grungy pop sound is executed very well on the album Bill, which is also, I believe, their debut album. It has that very traditional 90s alternative rock sound, but it also does blend some elements of psychedelic music in there as well, with some psychedelic arrangements, some more intriguing, I guess, psychedelic-esque vocal production, which does sort of... Um, help this album a lot. I really love the way the vocals are produced on this album. I love the very raw, gritty sound. I also, one of the, probably the thing I appreciate the most about the album, Bill, is that, you know, you could go from songs like My Umbrella, which is a much more standard, more pop-friendly alternative rock song, but then you could also get some more of the slower ones with more clean and ethereal guitars, which I think are, it's a really nice touch. Overall, there's a nice, um... Uh, from the from a maturity stance, there's something nice, nice and juvenile and fun and just energetic about this album. Well, it still comes across as a very serious project as well. Overall, I think Tripping Daisy deserves much more attention and credit than they often get, and I think Bill from 1992 is an excellent album. The second album I'm going to be covering in this video is from the metal band Melvin's Houdini from 1993. This is another album that does have some influence lying in the grunge scene, but this very powerful grunge-influenced sludge metal album, to me, is just a really solid, powerful, in-your-face, raw, and gritty project. It's very, it's very intense, it's very combative at times as well, and it can be a bit intrusive. It's just so in-your-face and raw, and I really love the way it reaches out to the listener. They embrace a very alternative, grungy sound on some of the slower tracks, such as Lizzie, which is one of my favorite tracks on here. And I think Melvin's, undeniably, their raw, gritty, metal, sludgy sound, by far, I think, is one of the pinnacle um, points, one of the key points in the progression of sludge metal as a genre. And I think the Melvin's very um, stripped back, very um, raw, in-your-face, almost punk-like production really adds an extra bit of character and um, relatability to this album. There's, I've, a lot of albums out there that are in this sort of metal stuff can be so polished to the point where you lose that connection. But I feel like on Houdini, the Melvins really do keep that raw, gritty, punk-style production that really does keep the listener captivated because it sounds like an album that you would hear coming out of your local scene. And my last thing regarding this album, Houdini, is that I do get a lot of vibes and influence, I think, from Metallica, from 
vocals, as well as even some of the riffs on a song like Set Me Straight. However, that's not necessarily a naysay or a negative point. I do think Melvins do take that sound and make it their own. Overall, this very good grunge-inspired sludge metal album by the Melvins Houdini is one of my favorite sludge metal albums. The third album I'm going to be covering kind of goes down this same path with sludge metal. It is from Neurosis through Silver in Blood from 1996. Now, Neurosis is one of those bands that I think is, like I previously said before, has a very solid, polished production. However, it doesn't really take too much away from the experience just because of how talented and how intriguing these instrumentals are on here. It's very atmospheric sludge metal, with many interludes and even parts of songs being pure ambiance with some excellent strings and synth pads and um, white noise throughout it. And it's a submersive blend of industrial metal, sludge metal, as well as ambient music, like I said. It's very disorienting, riveting, and just overall a gloomy sound. In fact, it's one of the most gloomy and dark albums I've ever heard, and that's not even necessarily a bad thing. I really love the way they are able to hammer such a heavy, deep sound to the listener while still coming across very professional and not overly dark and depressive to the point where, you know, it, it turns away the listener. Instead, it's very infectious, and it kept on bringing me back. In many ways, it seems like a spiritual successor to Black Sabbath's debut album. That very raw, just kind of gritty and frightening style, sounding sludgy sound that you heard on early Black Sabbath material is definitely updated and refreshed on Neurosis through, um, on the Neurosis album Through Silver and Blood from 1996. I do think this is one of my favorite uh, sludge metal albums. One of the most talented, well put together, well crafted, with some excellent, excellent atmosphere. Overall, Neurosis Through Silver and Blood from 1996 is an excellent album. We jump ahead a little bit when I'm talking about my fourth album, The Strokes Is This It from 2001. Now, I reviewed, or uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember if I did a review or if I covered it in my Albums I Missed series, but I did talk about um, The New Abnormal by The Strokes, which came out this year, which I thought was an alright album. I did like it. I gave it a 7 out of 10. But Is This It, to me, remains The Strokes' most compelling and most interesting work to date. It's definitely born out of the garage rock revival scene, which is undeniably dominating the rock scene in that era. And it's a very solid album, my favorite Strokes album for sure. There is something very thin about the production that I would usually consider a downside to an album, but the way they approach it on this makes it feel very raw, very garagey, very in your face, very personal. And very, um, you, I feel like you have a connection to it, a very good connection with the listener, because it almost feels like you're hearing this album played in a live club. Overall, I think Is This It is a wonderful cornerstone of Garage Rock Revival and of The Strokes discography. Not only is it an excellent debut from one of the most influential alternative outlets out there, but it is also simply, I think, one of the key albums from this era of music. And I think it wouldn't make sense for me to talk about some of the albums I'm about to talk about without bringing up The Strokes is the sit from 2001. The fourth, is it the fourth? No, it's the fifth, <laughs> the fifth album I'm going to be talking about in this video is from Interpol, Turn On The Bright Lights. Despite similarities with artists such as Joy Division, Interpol really does bring a lot of new life into the post-punk genre. This album came out in 2002, one year after The Strokes album did, and while The Strokes album is not necessarily a post-punk album, it is born with similar roots as this Interpol album. Uh, Turn On The Bright Lights, I think, is one of the greatest um, achievements of post-punk in the 21st century, with them really... with. And it's just a very well-executed and a really well-executed album that is on par with many of its post-punk influences from the 80s and 70s. I think Interpol definitely does craft out a pretty unique and diverse sound, definitely, on this album. And I think, well, I have some issues with their later works. I think they really did execute this project quite well. They definitely did bring post-punk to the 21st century with a new fresh take on it with some of the most intriguing melodies, some of the most intriguing guitar work I had heard from any of the post-punk revival bands. 
So yes, Interpol, Turn On The Bright Light from 2002 does safely land onto this list. Now the next album I'm going to be covering, I believe the sixth album I'm going to be covering, is from The Rapture, Echoes, from 2003. Once again, the next few albums I'm going to be covering do have a lot of similarities with the post-punk revival, but this album, Echoes by The Rapture, really does take dance punk as well as a good blend of post-punk and electronica and really blends it together in a very innovative and unique style, even having some disco vibes in there as well. Tracks like The House of, Je uh, the House of Jealous Lovers has a very throwback sort of sound to some of those earlier dance punk, earlier disco-y sounds, but they also have a very intriguing abstract guitar work, which I appreciate quite well. And also, the excellent, excellent harmonies on the track Heaven is another one that really does stick out to me as a high point on this album. Overall, I appreciate the blends of electronica on the opening track and then following it up with a very raw, gritty, in-your-face, garagey post-punk track right after. I think they do an excellent job bringing those two genres together in a way that many artists have not been able to do. And I also think that this is one of the best aging albums from this era. It sounds just as fresh now as it would have back in 2003. And I think The Rapture are a massively overlooked band, and I think Echoes play a, the e album Echoes plays a crucial role on the development of dance punk as well as paving the way for artists like LCD Sound System to get an even bigger outreach in the future. So yes, The Rapture Echoes from 2003 is an excellent album that I wish got much more attention with a good dance punk electronica as well as even post-punk vibe. Really solid album from 2003. Please give that a listen. The seventh album I'm going to be covering is from none other than The Killers, Hot Fuss, from 2004. The Killers is a band that I am quite fond of, I enjoy quite a bit, at least their early releases. As I'm sure some of you saw my coverage of Imploding the Mirage, which came out this year. I was less than ecstatic over it. I thought it was a very average album that played to their strengths, but didn't give much more. However, I can't say the... I could say the total opposite for Hot Fuss. Hot Fuss, to me, is a nearly flawless and powerful album with a really solid pop-punk song with excellent track after excellent track after excellent track. Influenced by a lot of the new wave from the 80s, as well as that whole post-punk scene in the 80s and 70s, as well as the revival that had been going on. It's a classic sound that really holds up to this day that I've heard several bands imitate time and time and time again. I think tracks like Mr. Brightside, Someone to Somebody Told Me, Smile Like You Mean It, Jenny Was a Friend of Mine, all the things that I've done. All of these songs are just excellent, excellent, excellent tracks. Excellent tracks that are some of the killer's best material and some of the best alternative pop rock to come out of the 2000s decade period. There is barely anything negative I could say about the album Hot Fuss. My only regret is not covering it sooner on this channel. I think the killers had one of the strongest debuts of any band, and I think that um, their second album, Sam's Town, really did continue off of the hype and the, the high point that was Hot Fuss, and it was a solid album. However, it wouldn't be long until they end up sort of falling off. But Hot Fuss is undeniably one of my favorite albums. It's one of the most solidly put together pop alternative rock albums out there with a solid sound that despite being 16 years old remains as new, as fresh, and as innovative as it was in 2004. The seventh album I'm going to be covering in this series is from Brazilian band. This, that's a first on this channel. CSS. Can Say Dace or Sexy. Probably butchered that title, so I'm just going to say CSS here. From 2005, this is a great Brazilian debut album. Once again, it's a blend of that indie 2000s sound with disco, post-punk, as well as synth-pop as well. Overall, it's a very unique sound with a great blend of both serious subject matter and serious songs, as well as a bit more satirical songs about meeting Paris Hilton and being an art bitch. Overall, I think CSS has a good witty humor to them, while also remaining a very intriguing and um, a great band that really does stop me in my tracks every time I listen to them. A song like Let's Make Love and Listen Death From Above is an excellent synth-pop, disco-inspired track that I think is one of their greatest songs with an excellent groovy bass line and groove. And the song Music Is My Hot Hot Sex is an alternative banger, which is definitely a highlight on the album. 
Overall, I wish CSS got a bit more attention. They often get written and pushed aside for being a bit too satirical, a bit not, not as serious. And I understand that criticism. They are a bit satirical in many spots. But I genuinely think music-wise, they really do have a great... They had a great thing going on in their debut album. And I definitely think that they are a really solid outlet, a very solid group with a good wide array of influences that all come together greatly on this album from 2005. CSS, Kasani De Sir Sexy. Probably once again mispronounced that. Definitely check out that album. We are reaching the end. With my eighth album I'm going to be talking about, or is it my eighth or my ninth? I've lost track. I'm going to say my ninth. It looks like my ninth album I'm going to be talking about in this video. is from Arctic Monkeys, their debut album, Whatever People Say I Am. Now, that is the shortened version I'm talking about here, album title-wise. Great indie debut from one of the most influential indie bands of the 21st century by far. Um, an infectious and twangy sound that really does stand out against its contemporaries with a very, a sound that really keeps on drawing the listener back with, like I said, a very twangy guitar sound throughout it. Even a ska influence in there as well, which is something I appreciate quite a bit. And I really love just the pure British energy coming from it. Or uh, are they British? They might be Australian. Either way, they have that pure uh, energy. I'm going to say Australian. I probably look like an idiot right now and I apologize. But the voice is what I'm talking about here. The accent really does come through really strong here. And I really like the way it comes across here. I do think this is probably Arctic Monkey's strongest album to date. Now, I know that a lot of people like AM and a lot of people like some of their later works. But I really do think Whatever People Say I Am is a really solid indie album with a really good twangy sound that stands out amongst its contemporaries without much negative to say here. Pretty solid debut. Pretty solid group. That's from 2006, by the way, and the final album I'm going to be talking about in this video is a bit newer. It is. It's from none other than one of my personal favorite rappers out there, Travis Scott, Astro World from 2018. Despite Rodeo being a much more influential album, arguably influencing a whole generation of rappers out there, Astro World to me is peak Travis Scott and peak psychedelic trap. It's just an excellent psychedelic trap sound polished to a T with solid features that really add to the album's character and with some of the most immersive psychedelic beats and instrumentals I've, that have ever been recorded. A track like Sicko Mode is one of the most interesting trap songs to ever reach number one on the charts. And I think the chord or the changes throughout the song are orgasmic in many ways and i really think that overall travis scott's auto-tuned effect vocals really do fit this psychedelic sound perfectly a songs like stargazing sicko mode you know no bystanders carousel rip screw butterfly effect are all some of travis scott's greatest material and some of the greatest trap music to come out ever and I genuinely think that Astroworld will be remembered as one of the greatest albums to come out of the 2010s. And I do think that when you add the excellent live show with roller coasters and just so much extravagant production, you know, Astroworld was a high point for Travis Scott. And I still have a lot of hope that Travis Scott could actually make something even better. He has a lot of potential. You know, Jack Boys was far from being a full studio album. And whenever he does drop his next major studio album, I really just hope it's as good as Astro World because Astro World was a phenomenal album with an excellent, cohesive, psychedelic trap sound that little have come close to perfecting besides Travis Scott. And it's going to be an influential album as the years go on. And I just think that despite it being a relatively new album coming out in 2018, Astro World is a perfectly constructed album. And I think Travis Scott deserves all the credit in the world for that project and the live show that went with it. So with that being said, that is the 10 albums from Tripping Daisy, The Melvins, Neurosis, The Strokes, Interpol, The Rapture, The Killers, CSS, Arctic Monkeys, and Travis Scott. I just dropped my phone. But that is it for now. I really love making these videos. Um, I'm hoping that people watch this because I know these videos do get a bit less views. But thank you all for watching. Thank you to all my subscribers for subscribing and getting me over 150 subscribers. It really does mean a lot to me. And I just love these 10 classic albums. And um, that is it for now. I will be back with new reviews shortly. Goodbye.